Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the second OC3PR of this season. Today we'll be discussing organ and tissue donation, an obviously important issue related to critical care, but also a topic which is responsible for helping so many patients in Ontario and Canada. OC3PR, for those who are unaware, is a webinar series provided by Critical Care Services Ontario. It tries to assist healthcare professionals along with other members of the hospital teams improve the care they provide to acutely ill patients. It provides best practice strategies with the intent to improve our healthcare system. You, the listener, will have the opportunity to submit questions, which today will be fielded by Dr. Jose Terrio and Neil Adekari, both members of the OC3PR Executive Committee. To submit questions, please type and send them to the individual's name Q&A for question and answer. This webinar, along with previous sessions, are available at the CCSO website and on their YouTube channel. As before, we ask that you do your best to keep yourself muted. We also ask that you take the time to fill out the survey at the end of today's webinar, as your feedback is greatly appreciated, as it helps us plan future events. Continue to look for future webinars on the CCSO website or on their YouTube channel. By the very nature of critical care, our role in assisting with the process of organ and tissue donation is essential for this life-saving and life-altering process to occur. I know that in the tragedies that we so often see in our ICUs, that many families and friends are able to find some solace in the passing of their loved ones, knowing that others can be helped by organ donation as a result of that tragedy. How that process presently occurs and what can be done to improve this system is the focus of today's OC3PR. As most of us know in Ontario, the Trillium Gift of Life Network is the group that is primarily responsible for making the success that it is. We are fortunate with us today to have two leaders with that team. First is Dr. Andrew Healy, is, who is an emergency and critical care physician. He's an attending intensivist in the William Osler Health System and a staff emergency physician at St. Joseph Healthcare in Hamilton. Dr. Healy is currently the Provincial Medical Director for Donation with Trillium Gift of Life. He is also a regional critical care lead with Ontario Health. Dr. Healy is an associate clinical professor at McMaster University, where his academic interests focus on issues pertaining to organ donation, including improving determination of brain death, the donation process, as well as health system leadership. Presenting with Andrew today is Ms. Janice Bytel. Um, she received her baccalaureate of Nursing Science from the University of Saskatchewan and her Master's of Science in Nursing from the University of Toronto. Currently, she is the Director of Hospital Programs, Education and Professional Practice for the Trillium Gift of Life Network. Prior to this, she held positions in critical care, clinical education, professional practice and patient relations. Janice has participated in multiple national forums related to organ donation and currently directs initiatives to support the work of donation in Ontario hospitals while overseeing the education for TGLN's staff and healthcare professional and supports the donation physician program. Our objectives today will be to describe the current performance of organ donation in Ontario. We will hear about leading practices at the highest performing donation hospitals and aim to identify ways to potentially improve performance and reduce case length, all in a collaborative fashion. Andrew and Janice, thank you both for taking the time to present with us today. I believe, Andrew, you'll be starting, so I'll pass it on to you and look forward to your presentation of you. Thanks very much, uh, Dave. <laughs> we're uh, we're really happy to be here. I see lots of familiar names um, uh, in the uh, in the participant list today. So looking forward to to a good discussion um, uh, once we're done presenting this. And I'm really privileged to be able to present with uh, Janice, who's got a long history in the organ and tissue donation system in Ontario, uh, and has really been uh, uh, really brings substantial expertise to evaluation of the data and the performance, which you're going to hear lots about from from Janice today. 
I, I want to start by by echoing some of Dave's sentiments. You know, in our in our sort of difficult um, uh, situations where where patients approach the end of life, we sometimes feel that um, you know it's difficult to see that there's anything um, uh, positive coming out of that, and donation gives us a small light. Uh, uh, in those very difficult moments at the end of life. And that requires a substantial collaborative effort between our organization and over 60 hospitals in Ontario. And we are uh, grateful for that. We sometimes ask a little bit, but most often we ask a lot of you in doing that, especially in critical care. Um, and in many, many circumstances, we're, we're, um, we're really privileged to have you participate in that process in a very um, a very substantial way. And we're, we're really happy that you're able to support our, our donor families as they are appreciative of your ongoing support and, and uh, collaboration. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> today, we're going to talk, uh, as Dave said at the beginning, about current organ donation and transplantation system performance in Ontario from a provincial perspective. Uh, we'll talk about some leading practices that exist at those the, at those uh, best performing hospitals. We'll define what we mean by collaborative approach in the and the areas in which we can intersect and and where um, uh, that collaborative approach might help us reduce case length and improve the experience for uh, families and patients at the end of their life. Um, whenever we present data from an external organization, we have a lot of insight into the fact that we set. Somebody has to draw a line at some point. And so, you know, you like lots of times you one could quibble or argue over our definitions. And we're even going to talk a little bit about how one might consider modifying one of our definitions today in the talk. Um, but today we will do our best to make sure that you understand our definitions. If you don't, please put questions in the chat. We're happy to answer those. Um, and, um, you know, our data collection methods are imperfect, just like all data collection uh, methods. But we're really presenting you the best data we have available to answer the questions that, that are most pressing for our ODT system uh, uh, as of today in November 2023. And whenever we do that, we come with a set of assumptions, <clears throat> and sometimes those assumptions are not right. And so it's it's a great opportunity for us today to hear from you if you think that doesn't make any sense to my clinical experience, uh, and we can help um, uh, help integrate your feedback into uh, our understanding of the system from end to end. Uh, so I'm going to uh, turn it over to Janice to talk about the current organ donation and tissue uh, system performance. We're going to look at three major areas. General system performance, things like consent rate and how many families are we offering this opportunity to. We're going to talk about a group of patients and families that either don't or won't talk to TGLN. Uh, and while that may sound like, uh, in the words of my 13-year-old, an issue, not an ish me, uh, I'm hoping to sort of share, to shift that responsibility a little bit today, to, to share that responsibility. And then... Um, we're going to talk about declines in donation. And while that might not feel like we own that as intensivists, in fact, I'm going to make an argument that some of those declines are not enduring. And so we have a part to play in ensuring families are set up for the best um, for the best the best decision they can make, not only about donation, but about end of life care. Janice. Great, thanks. So on this slide, you can see the inverted pyramid representing the journey from a potential eligible donor to donor. And what we want to really share here is that we don't have um, the luxury of losing any donors at any point along the process. As a mature system, we think that we actually do get the majority of ventilator referrals of, of people who could become organ donors at the end of their life. But a lot happens between the referral and um, even us being able to have a conversation with the families. Sometimes those referrals come in a bit too late or close to the withdrawal situation, and we're not able to talk to families. And then, as Andrew said, sometimes the, uh, there's reasons why we don't get to speak to families. So I'm going to spend some time talking about why we don't get to actually have a donation discussion with families. But even after we talk to families and they consent, we know we lose uh, uh, more potential donors as we engage in tests for medical suitability and the recovered. So although we had 8,000 organ and tissue or organ referrals last year, we really uh, ended up with 319 donors. 
So when we move to the next slide, um, we always need to reflect on why we're actually involved in the ODT system. And at the heart of it, there's those people who are waiting for transplants. And although right now, if you, you see the list, um, it's at 1,100, 11,060, uh, 11, you can see that it's probably the smallest you may have seen it. But um, I don't think we can be falsely reassured by that. We do still have significant people waiting. Two thirds of those people are waiting for kidneys. And we do believe the list is going to actually increase as people in the system get worked up and, and added to the, the transplant list. And some of you in your hospitals may have actually experienced the activity that we've had in the last uh, six months. So in the first half of this year, we've had 616 organ donors. And that means that there was uh, just under 200 transplants done. And that's deceased donation transplants alone. That roughly is equivalent to about 3.5 deceased donor transplants every day. And so we've been keeping our uh, transplant partners busy. And I was thrilled to hear at a recent St. Mike's committee meeting uh, from our transplant representatives that they've actually had to open more clinics to care for the patients who've received transplants. And so this, this uh, six months has been uh, much more active than uh, the first month of the previous year or even the latter half of last year. Predominantly, the reasons for increases have been an increased number of uh, DNC potential donors, as well as um, patients for DCC or donation after circulatory um, determination of death. Those donors have actually um, uh, became real donors as they move through the process. A couple of other reasons that we know that we're following, and that's uh, onto our next slide, is the work that we've been doing with eligible approach rate. So we've been working very hard to ensure, and, and Andrew's gonna talk about some of the goals in the system, to talk to families. We've seen um, a slight increase in this. Provincial target is 90%. We've seen it go up to 89%. And um, consent rate is up, but we have not seen the pre-pandemic recovery of reaching the levels of consent prior to uh, us entering this. So we, we still have hope related to improvement, and but I want Andrew to talk more about really what the goals of our program are when we work with families. You're on mute, Andrew. Thanks, Janice. Thanks. So there's a group of patients that we worry about that, um, you know, people people say, you know, the, the organ donation system is really about getting consent. Um, you know, I, I would I would sharply oppose people to say that our direction is to get consent. And the reason I would do that is that um, actually our job is to make sure that that family in the room, the substitute decision maker, or in some cases, like in medical assistance and dying, where the patient is is uh, capable and competent uh, to make that decision themselves. Um, you know, our job is to make sure that they have the, the right information to make the right decision for them. So if you were to think about this as an organ donation organization, well, you know, the first question that comes to mind, how do you define success? And this certainly is, is part and parcel of, of things in, uh, you know, in my own clinical experience where, you know, sometimes not getting consent feels like a failure because you feel like you haven't set people up for the right decision. Um, this is a, a graph that I show often when we think about decisions in our, our ICU. On the on the y-axis, you can see the, the the proportion of favorable parole decisions made by this judicial board, and on the x-axis, you see the ordinal position of the day, and the circles represent food. So, you know, when we think about our own critical care patients, our own families making very difficult decisions. The, the question that I ask myself is, am, am I setting up my family to make the right decision for their loved one at this time? And, and how you define that depends on, you know, your, your relationship with that family and how, how we proceed with our relationships in critical care. I certainly want my, my judicial decision made by a well-fed uh, uh, parole judge. And at the same time, I want my families in the ICU to feel like they've had a night of rest even though they believe they won't sleep, we all know that when they go home and become horizontal, they all sleep. 
And when they come back, they're in a better space. We often don't have food and water for very, you know, our very basic participants in, in critical care. And so those are things to think about as we set people up to make difficult decisions. I would also say that remember that donation is a separate conversation, an expert conversation. It, it isn't a question, and we see that more and more. Um, uh, sorry, less and less in our in our critical care environment in Ontario. And it's never simply a mention of donation is a possibility if you're interested, because that acknowledges that this decision can be made at a at a you know at a very rapid level. In fact, it's a decision that needs very careful consideration. So if somebody was to ask me, how would you define success within the donation system in Ontario, and, you know, a transplanter would say the most organs possible. You know, they might say everybody says yes to, 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 um, uh, to donation. I would counter that. I would say 100% of our families are asked. 100% of those asks are planned in a way that sets the family up to make the right decision for them. And nobody regrets that decision in, in three months time. For me, that's 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 a very well defined but very difficult to achieve objective for an organ donation organization. We know from this old study in 2012 now, um, uh, where they looked at the endurance of a decision. How you know in three months' time, when you look back, the people who say no, and this is an incredibly difficult group to get access to, and as some researchers have been able to access small portions of this group, but in the people who've said no, 52% in this study, a fairly substantial study, actually looked back in their decision and said, if given the time again, we would actually donate. And so th this is why we worry when people say no, is that decision going to be enduring for them? Now, sometimes it is. Sometimes, you know, 7 to 10% of the time, it, it they still stay, they would not donate, and a bunch of the other, uh, the, a bunch of the other people were undecided. Decided. So I'm going to hand it back to Janice now to talk about those people who don't or won't talk to TGLN, so they don't have an opportunity to hear from us about what donation is about. Janice? Great. Thanks, Andrew. So when we look at this slide, we're down in the middle of the, the, the pyramid before we actually get a chance to speak with families. And these are the referrals eligible for approach. Now, sometimes there's a reason why we don't approach them. And the black band at the bottom, those numbers represent the cases that we closed due to COVID. And you can see the increase and then subsequent decrease over the last few years related to that. Of course, in green, we have the approaches that we were able to do, but it's the suitable not approach that I wanted to get into more detail with to help you understand um, you know, whether there are any modifiable factors that we can address and maybe speak with more people. So as we dive into that, what we've done is on the bottom is this category we're very concerned about and you're going to hear us talked about. And so for 22-23, there were 111 people that we didn't have the opportunity to have a donation discussion with in a meaningful way. I'll be sharing more information about why that didn't happen, but essentially it was that the family said they did not want to speak to someone from TGLN. So we'll talk more in detail about that um, uh, coming up. But then when we look at the next common reason or the next reason, a proportion of the reasons, it's around the fact that there's no um, next of kin available. And so if there's no next of kin available and patients do not have a registered consent decision, we aren't able to move forward with donation. We are able to actually move forward with those um, situations where there is a registered consent decision. Um, but uh, you know, in, in this situation, when there's not a registered consent decision, we can't do that. And so moving forward, um, we see, we have a, a category called hospital prevents. And in terms of this category, what we're actually talking about is the referral comes in, but it's about that timing between the referral and the window for withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment. Um, and in these cases, uh, there isn't a window because pressers have already been actually um, turned off or on occasion. Um, in fact, people have, um, uh, and extubated the patient. And then for the next category that we're looking at is uh, those families who aren't accepting of, uh, of DNC. And for that category, what we're looking at is we don't approach families if they're not accepting 
uh, DNC. If there's an opportunity for DCC and they're eligible for organ donation after DCC, we do have a protocol to approach uh, following a potential um, removal of somatic support. But if they're over 75, then we're not actually able to um, offer the opt opportunity to donate. And then finally, we have those situations, although we're working on it, you can see that both the imminent withdrawal and the hospital prevents approach categories have decreased over the years. We're working on this with timely referral. The Im imminent referral is really those situations where we have the um, uh, family around the bedside. So again, hearing about those cases sooner would have been very useful to know about. So let's take a little deeper dive into what that means for our metrics and our system. So currently I showed you the eligible approach rate and we're really pleased that it's up to 89%. The, the challenge is, is that for these families who we don't have conversations with because they don't want to speak to us, they're in, that's invisible in this metric. And so if we took that um, 111 individuals and said that we didn't have a chance to approach these, that would drop our approach rate to, to 81%. Similarly, with our consent rate, um, although we are at 53% and recovering, if we said that those situations are actually a decline, it would drop our consent rate quite significantly. So this is why Andrew and I are talking about this today and seeking your help, because we're quite concerned about these situations. And again, is there anything that we can do together to, to, to change that? So what do we know about that? So as an area of concern, we're really trying to understand that. So we started by recording what we're hearing from healthcare professionals about why people don't wanna to speak to us, or sometimes the family themselves when they hang up on us or close, close the door to us, really. And 30 to 40% of the time, it, they say they're aware of TGLN. We're not attributing any meaning to that, but, but simply noting that that's what they're saying. In 20% of the situations, it's because they want to proceed or their timeline for withdrawal um, is, is imminent. 20 to 30% of the time, it's because the patient didn't want to be a donor. And if that's true, that's a that's a good no, as Andrew said, it's a good no. 20% um, of the time, we actually don't know why, sometimes because we're, we're not as connected as we'd like to be in the situations. So we've done further explorations on this on the next slide. And we're aware that um, initially when we looked at this through the pandemic, 20% of the time, there was no coordinator involved at all. So no OTDC was involved. We've done some work on that. We've reduced it to 10% to ensure that there's a, um, a coordinator connected to understand what's going on in the situation and with the family. And about 40% of the time, it's an attempted phone approach. Sometimes it's because the family's not at the hospital. Sometimes it's because we there's a misunderstanding or um, an issue with how we're dispatching coordinators. Sometimes it's because we don't have the staff to be on site. And sometimes it's because of the timing. So this is mixed, but we do know we do better in person and always strive to be in person. So we're tracking that. We're aware that no hospitals um, have more of these cases than the others. That's one of the first things we looked at for a signal. But there is one hospital that's doing really well and has a super low incidence of this of Windsor. And again, we're trying to understand what's different in Windsor and what's happening in their practice that this, this rarely happens. And we also know, um, and really I could have put this first, this is the first thing we looked at, was it our staff? Was it our staff who actually were involved in these, but there's no cluster ar around the staff. So that's some of the investigation that we've done. We've talked about, you know, could, is this really a decline or do we need to explore these further? And so we've put together a list of the declines, reasons, the top five reasons. So first of all, we've mapped out what this would look like if um, we included not wanting to speak with us as a reason for decline. But overall, you can see in the tan color that it's the length of the time that it takes for donation that the majority of families are saying, no, they don't wanna donate. And I have more information on case length later. 
Um, as we pull up the other reasons, the family's telling us it's not what the patient would have wanted. We also have that a patient had a previous stated wish not to donate. And again, if that's so, that is a good no. And then finally, we have this category of that the patient has been to enough. And so are we doing enough to support that family in those situations uh, to, to help them feel better about the situation and enabling them to say yes to donation if it was what their, their loved one wanted at end of life? So case length. So we've been watching this for quite some time. We do have information on referral to dispatch and to approach. It's a little muddy because we have um, some coordinators who are on site and there's not technically a dispatch. They're following a case because they're an in-hospital coordinator. But really we're focusing on these other time points, approach, consent, med social, allocation, acceptance, and um, when we're getting to the OR. And so um, when we look at those, we really need to understand what's happening in terms of case length. So on the next slide, you're going to see a snapshot. We were concerned about case length prior to the pandemic and since about 2015-16, it's actually been the leading reason why people say no to donation. So we were worried about it before and we were at almost 50 hours as a median for a case. You can see what's happened through the last few years and we have not yet got back in 23, 24, although we've seen some gains to actually um, reduce that case length time, therefore addressing that number one reason why families say no to us. And the categories that have increased are really um, the three categories of approach to consent, consent to med-soch and um, uh, uh, med -soch, med -soch to allocation and allocation to acceptance. So if we look at where we think there's opportunities in the system to um, for uh, you as our partners to help us, it's with those two areas. And then when we look at what happens during that time, you're seeing the lab workup, the imaging, the bronc, the AVGs, and the additional diagnostic tests happen while we're doing med social allocation. And then once we start talking to the transplant programs, there's um, requests for additional testing. And then there is the usual OR setting time, which we know is, an, is an, a logistical thing within itself. So I want to turn it over uh, back to, to Andrew to talk about some of the leading practices that we think will help us with some of these modifying factors. Okay, so I'm going to share with us a, a look at a few leading practices that we're seeing in hospitals that are performing really well. And when we say performing really well, what we mean is uh, the families are being asked in a planned way, in a way that that they can hear the information and that they that they're beginning to start to appreciate there's an endurance of that success. So remember, from an organ donation organization, this is how I would see it. I would say 100% of them are asked, 100% of those asks are planned, and nobody regrets their decision. From a family perspective, if you look at lots of research that's happening out of Ontario and out of other places, families would describe this as an ask that's well-informed, so they understand the process. They have time and space to reflect on the question. And again, it's an enduring answer. Meaning in three months, if you ask me, did you make the right decision back then? And when that was, you know, the worst day of your life, when we were, when you were told that your child had died because of a, a traumatic brain injury, did you make the right decision for, for you and for that child uh, at that time? And I think this speaks volumes to how we define our success as an intensive care community, because our, you know, our responsibility to, to patients is to save life and, and relieve suffering, and then to protect the interests of the dying patient while committing ourselves to this, this system of donation and, and transplant in the, in, the, in the process where people want to give, they want something good to come out of, um, out of the experience of end-of-life care in the ICU. So... <clears throat> The, the first leading practice is this idea of facilitating a transition. So whether we, um, you know, we, we at, the, at the time when organ donation begins to become a consideration, you have either declared the patient dead and told the family and they have accepted that, or you have um, reached a consens consensual decision with the family to withdraw invasive physiologic support and move to a palliative care approach. 
When you do that, our coordinators, our experts who go through, you know, training four times a year, high fidelity simulation on a variety of aspects to ensure that they're caring for families in a good way um, and that they that the, fa the families have an opportunity to give us feedback on how those coordinators manage that family interaction. The, the places that do this describe this to us. They describe a warm introduction. And what we mean by that is the, the, the coordinator is welcomed as a member of their team associated with end-of-life care. And are, you know, we're not asking you to lie. We're not asking you to hide anything. But to introduce them as a staff member from Ontario Health or Children Gift of Life Network who's here, who cares with our, fam our, our families at the end of life to help you make the right decisions at this point. This decision occurs, and we, you know, there's lots of literature in, in now that's come out in Ontario and across Canada where people have had these conversations in the hallway, or they've had the conversations at the bedside of the patient who's intermittently conscious. Um, the right place and time, and increasingly, I don't know about for you, but for us in my own ICU, this is a challenge. Our waiting rooms are turned into to, you know, social distancing spaces for other purposes, but the right place and time to have this conversation. As a physician and as a nurse and as a healthcare professional within the healthcare team at the hospital, you can tell us the family is ready to have this conversation in your view, or they're not ready to have this conversation. And we, we really respect that input. That conversation should be well planned. It shouldn't be by phone. So we should have lots of opportunity. You should ask for us and we'll be available to the family. And if the, the discussion doesn't work out that it's not for us, then we'll leave. Um, you know, we're only going to approach a family if you've declared the patient dead or if the patient and you, if the family and you have made a decision for the patient that withdrawal and basis support is the right, um, is the right next step. The, the hospitals that perform particularly well in DCC describe this transition as one with open timeframes. So one of our, one of uh, a good friend of mine, who's an intensivist in, in Windsor actually often uses the words, there's lots of stuff that we have to do before we arrive at a time for withdrawal of life support and, and we'll get those things rolling for you and then we'll set a time. There's a reassurance that although there's a transition to a different individual who's going to talk about a different approach, that there's ongoing care offered to that family and to the patient, regardless of whatever decisions they make at this point. And then some hospitals actually, by a matter of policy, say, we want you to talk to TJO, and even if your answer is going to be no. Um, you know, Dave Gard or Dale Gardner is a, 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 my one of the uh, world leaders in donation and and um, has been for a long time. He leads the NHSBT uh, work out of, out of the UK for this. And he talks about having the family outside the room when he's having an end of life care discussion, much like you might talk about uh, holding on to a bougie at your bedside when you're about to intubate. Now, this might be a little bit of a dated graphic because maybe maybe nobody's using bougies anymore with, with video laryngoscopes, who knows, but th that's his analogy. And to be honest, just, just shared it with me a few weeks ago. You know, Would you ever go into an airway scenario without a plan B or a plan C? You probably always have that plan B or plan C in your mind. Um, and if you don't, then then you, you know you you can be caught off guard, and that's not dissimilar to what happens when families make an unexpected or un or decision to withdraw invasive support, and you have to say it's going to be a couple of hours before we can get a team member on site to talk to you about next steps. And so having the having having us involved early, may, some people see as a conflict, and other people see as that bougie at the bedside that I'm probably not going to use, and the RT doesn't want you to take it out of the package. And so maybe it's off in the distance at the at, at the nurse's desk, but it, you know it's available to you, and if you ask for it, you can have it. So the summary from these leading hospitals is to build in time, space, and rest for family. There's a number of things that we need to be sorted before we set a time for next steps. I'm not a big fan of people telling me how to talk to families. I gotta be honest, I hate scripting actually. But these two, these two um, uh, pieces of information I've actually used in my own practice and they actually feel all right. So I thought I'd share them with you. Um, you know, as you know, as a way to introduce TJLN, you know, as part of end of life care, we connect families and patients with a coordinator from, from Ontario Health or TJLN to talk about next steps for you and what's right. And when they say no, I often will say, you know, we encourage all patients and, and substitute decision makers to speak with them because sometimes you're not aware of, of a registered decision or new information about who can be helped. And we understand if you say no, we'll respect that and give you the same care one way or another. But please open the door to them and let them consider that. We don't know in Ontario what that difference would be. 
We think it would be small, but non-zero. And as we said, the, the opportunities to donate at the end of life are about one fifth uh, the, the likelihood that you would, be a, you would be in need of a transplant. And so still really important. So what do we mean by collaborative approach? What we mean is that we all have a unity of mission here. So we all want what's best for families and what's best for our donors, which are in front of us. And as I've frequently said, even though I have a recipient in my family who I eat a meal with every day, most days anyway, I have a recipient in my own family. The recipient, although part of the mission, are certainly not your responsibility as a critical care uh, a physician. But you and I, the organ donation organization and the critical care unit, share a unity of mission around the care of the family and the donor. We don't get it right all the time. We definitely do not. And we're working to improve that. But we, we share that unity of mission. The second thing we share is a dependence on the relationships and trust that the critical care physicians and professionals have built with families. We know that even one negative interaction in a hospital stay drastically affects the, the, the person's ability to provide consent for organ donation. So that, that building, as, as we know in all healthcare decisions, as soon as we lose trust with the family member, we know that we have a lot of work to do to rebuild that trust. And we rely on your experience, your expertise at the bedside. If something isn't going right with a case, we actually want to hear about it in real time. We have physicians on call 24 seven, we have coordinators who are at the bedside. We wanna hear that we're not getting it right, that there's something going on with the donor that we don't understand or that we are not seemingly acknowledging. That care partnership that exists is unique, uh, at least in North America, because in the US that there, there's a greater distance between the intensive care staff and the ODO. So how does it and how can it help? And I just thought I'd share a couple of cases that have happened and then we'll conclude the, the session and take some questions. This is a case where the liver team and, and the liver team has very, um, uh, sometimes they have very challenging requests for us to meet biopsies, ultrasounds and CTs because their patients are, are quite ill. The, the liver team asked for a CT scan, which would actually cause the OR to be bumped by 16 hours. In order to get the CT and the result, that's what would have been required. There was already an ultrasound done. Um, and so the MRP actually reached out to the donation support physician and said, why the hell do these people need a CT? I don't understand. Uh, we can't seem to satisfy them. And so the question was relayed back to that, to that intensivist to say, actually, it's about size. So there was a conversation that was facilitated with the local radiologist and the transplanting liver surgeon. They had their questions answered based on available Im imaging and the, the operating room uh, uh, recovery pr proceeded without any additional delay. Um, we heard even yesterday when we were talking about building this, this talk, actually, that sometimes, you know, the, the most common time for us to get consent is at 6 p.m. And that's because oftentimes these activities occur after rounds. We understand, and I'm an intensivist, oftentimes I do determination of death at the end of my rounds. But, you know, then comes this massive request from TGLN, which feels sometimes to the intensive care community like we're dumping the dump truck on top of the back of the one person who's going to be around until the following morning at eight o'clock. And that's particularly magnified at hospitals without learners, but it even occurs in increasingly at hospitals with lots of learners around. So once we start this process, there's an ability to work with the on-site on coordinator and even the donation support physician if necessary to, to time these tests. So maybe the radiology stuff can get done overnight. We can focus on our own laboratory evaluation, getting our HLA and serology back from the provincial lab. While in the morning, maybe there's an opportunity to coordinate early bronchoscopy and echocardiography. And at that same time, collaborating with the OTDC, the, the, the on-site nurse specialist from us, to help set that OR time so that it, it isn't a burden to you. It isn't an ongoing burden to the ICU when, when beds and, and nursing staff, more importantly, um, uh, and other healthcare staff are, are pressed for, for uh, resources. So we would encourage a real collaborative conversation about coordinating these tests, because sometimes it actually would be helpful to do a bronchoscopy early, because maybe that's the only organ on the table. Other times, it won't be necessary uh, to do until the following morning or even the following afternoon, depending on the sequence of other activities. So if you work with us together and we have good communication, we're likely to do that. The final scenario often occurs where, uh, and, and it occurs not, not uh, like quite frequently, where 
the as an intensivist or as a as a healthcare system, we're not comfortable having TGLN present. So I'm encouraging you to think about TGLN a little bit like a bougie. Please don't compare our nurses to a bougie. I'm sure I'm going to get in trouble with that for some in some somehow. But I'm asking you to think about this as. The, the approach that's in the distance that you're probably not going to use because the video laryngoscope is going to work just fine. But if our notifications occur early, we can ensure that your family doesn't have to wait. That doesn't mean that we're muddling or getting involved in the family communication. We will keep good lines of communication open with you to ensure that we're not overstepping. And if we don't, then you should, you should give us that feedback and we'll work with you to fix it. So I would encourage people, and certainly in my practice where I, I'm not sure, and lots of times when we go into family meetings, we're not sure what the outcome's going to be, keep in mind that having a bougie at the desk is not a bad idea. And even when I'm really not sure what the outcome's going to be, and families might be leaning towards um, ongoing uh, critical care with tracheostomy and feeding tube insertions, I'll often say, although I think that's where they're going to go, I'm not sure. Um, and so I, I'm I'm open to having people in the unit. It doesn't mean I'm going to have you involved in their care. I'm not. Um, until we make the right decision for this patient. And if somebody asks me about that practice and say, doesn't that, doesn't that cause you concern from an ethical standpoint? I'm completely comfortable being open about that. I wouldn't have an ethical problem explaining this just like I've explained it to you. So the areas of real potential collaboration, this is our last slide, really focus on timely and early notification and good communication between us and the ICU, us and the ICU. that warm family introduction and family setup to make the right decision. When, when I have taken a, a page from some of the feedback that I did when I did some of the approach training myself, which was, which was intimidating for me and enjoyable for those people watching me do it, I think, um, you know, when the family said, you know, you re really didn't set us up here. You were more focused on the consent as opposed to the 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 right decision for the family. And so I now, as part of my practice, actually try and encourage when families are going to make a decision the following day about withdrawal, I ask them to, I know you don't want to leave the bedside, but go home and sleep. When you lie down, you're going to sleep. Everybody sleeps. Um, and when you come back, you'll be in a better headspace to make the right decision. So I've taken a page from that, even when donation is not on the table. Um, the collaboration with us for testing for determination of death, there's new guidelines out. We've had a lot of time to absorb those. Please feel free to use us as resources. And then the area where we often intersect is this resource area where testing, cardiac testing, radiology, and operating room availability often require us to have a good collaborative conversation. Um, and we're open to those those considerations. Sometimes we ask too much. And, and actually, Dave and I have had a, a very good conversation about circumstances where, where we're asking too much of a family or too much of a hospital system and where we can help to negotiate that right, the right touch for that. So acknowledging that organ and tissue donation is an integral part of high quality end of life care in your practice. And that high quality end of life care can't really happen without organ tissue donation. And the and the the, the um, opposite of that is also true. So we'll stop there and uh, give some time for, for questions. Um, uh, thanks very much for having us, Dave. And thanks, Janice, for your expertise. Well, thank you both for, for taking the time to come. Um, it, there was a lot there. Um, I, I must admit, I was a little taken back when you said that was a dated picture. I thought you were going to go on about the infection control practice uh, that was absent <laughs> in that. But uh, uh, it, it's uh, the focus on the bougie as an anesthesiologist who doesn't like the bougie. Um, maybe I need to go back to that. But my question. Maybe it, it's the light wand for you, Dave. Maybe uh, you know, it could light be. Wand, could be again, dating ourselves here. But a, a question for Janice. And I, I'm putting back, you know, I'm having flashbacks when I was, was the department head for critical care. And one of the things I thought was so important was our lounge, the family lounge, uh, you know, Certainly with the changes with COVID, people don't spend the same time that it was there. But in the sites that have higher conversion, is there anything in the lounge that kind of sets the stage? And I always, I, I'm a big believer in, in you know, we have a TV there that's doing nothing 95% of the time. But the idea of, of showing, you know, people have been helped. I'm wondering, would that, is there any role for that? Um, I, I think Andrew knows we have our our donor board that 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 we have right by the ICU to to recognize the contribution 
of, of others and does that have a role in helping the conversion in or if anything setting the stage to make that the, the initial discussions better and I, I don't know if there's any science or data on that and and so i i I put it to you to, to see what your thoughts on that might be. And, and Andrew, feel free to, to chime in as well. Yeah, we, we again, there isn't any data on that. One of the things um, we've talked about at different committee meetings and some hospitals have done is put some sort of acknowledgement in the waiting room or quiet room um, uh, around thanking donor families. Um, there are thoughts that uh, brochures are helpful in that area. It really feels that we need to actually start a lot earlier than that uh, in terms of uh, uh, be a donor and registration. Um, so in the moment, there's a lot of things for them to take in. And and, and you said it hasn't been um, studied, but there is some sense that there's some comfort if it's around them and at least is a bit familiar to them that they've seen some language. So it doesn't... Ex um, it, it basically answers your question that we haven't studied it. We don't know for sure, but we appreciate that that these conversations are best much in front of the actual event of landing the family and the patient in that setting. And, and Dave, I would just share that in the UK, they looked um, in a couple of small centers that had um, donor recognition walls like like the beautiful one that you uh, have in Ottawa and that we were really privileged to watch you watch you uh, facilitate. Um, you know, I think that um, those kinds of things where people are being thanked for the contribution and the effort and the bravery that they they undertake by by proceeding with offering us consent. Um, because really that's all they have control over. They don't have control over anything after they say yes to, to donation. Um, that that particularly uh, seems to have a positive association with consent, whether that's because those hospitals that have those have a positive donation culture to begin with, like yours, um, I'm not sure. Okay. And I hope you bring back the the ceremony that you, we used to have uh, it. Uh, unfortunately, that has gone away. I think that gave some closure and and some additional comfort to the family um, that that we used to experience. Uh, Josea, I'm going to go to you next, and then I'll follow with Neil. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Janice and Andrew, for an excellent presentation. Lots of information and lots to think about. So I was curious to hear from you a little bit more, Janice, on the when you presented the different reasons why we couldn't obtain or did not have enough time and and i got stuck on the hospital prevents because i i have the impression maybe that's where we can do a little bit more work or we can actually have an impact when we understand a little bit better and i was wondering if you had identified um specific barriers or gaps that maybe we are unaware of and that we can actually include and bring on into our practices. And I and and for that, I like the the uh, parallel and and the the thoughts of of giving the family says, you know what, um, when you know we've come to a decision, but we need a little bit more time before we start, you know, putting things into place. And I think it gives that opportunity to to settle a little bit and move the door. So. Um, if, if you don't mind, I may start using that a little bit more in, in my interactions with family. But I'm curious about that hospital prevents. And is there some specific barriers and gaps that maybe we, we need to know and we can uh, act upon? So thank you. Yeah. So first of all, I just want to say that that we're, we're going to be renaming that uh, because it sounds very blamey uh, in terms of the hospital. So we're, we're going to be renaming that when we do updates to our system. But essentially that category of um, stuff is, uh, or category of outcome is when um, pressors have been stopped or a patient has been extubated prior to calling uh, TGLN. And so I think that um, strategies that people have used is incorporating um, when people are talking about an end-of-life care set 
that um, uh, call to TGLN or call back to TGLN is actually one of the things that's the listed on it. We also have something called a respiratory pause where we work with the registered um, uh, RTs to be able to, um, when they're coming to do any of that care, to ask that question and empower them to ask that question, whether TGLN's been called. So these are um, last minute things that we're trying to do to capture that, to make sure we get the call before any uh, vasoactive pressors are turned off or before a patient is extubated. Um, again, some of those things that have been done sort of in sooner in the timeline is, is uh, at rounds, just asking if the patient meets the, the criteria that Andrew showed uh, to, to be called in and um, to ensure that, that those uh, actions to start the final phase of end of life care for that patient aren't, aren't started. Did that answer your question? Yes, I think it it is. I, I I think it is the the ward the warding of hospital prevents, and I think it's it's not really the hospital prevents. I think it's just a question of of having a timeline and understanding the timeline and making sure we have the proper triggers or check boxes um, before we start weaning the vasopressors, before we start weaning ventilation, so that we have that chance of uh, intervening um, with the family. So yes, thank you very much. Um, I'll pass it back to, uh, to Dave. Thanks, Jose. I'll, I'll go to Neil. I, I just looking at our time. I, I think we have about ten more minutes. So Neil. Yeah, just uh, if, if folks want to put uh, questions into the chat, please do so to uh, Q and A one or Q and A two. Um, thanks very much for the, for that presentation. Um, I, I was struck by the fact that there's um, a multitude of factors that contribute to going from that base of the pyramid of uh, eligible organ and tissue don donors to to, um, to to ones that actually um, uh, uh, are able to donate. Um, and I was also struck by the fact that um, despite um, a lot of effort, at various sites over many years in a very complex series of moving parts that we seem to be basically doing about the same as we were five years ago. Uh, maybe it got worse a bit, not a bit better. I was wondering if you could comment on, uh, and I guess from a personal point of view, because as opposed to your official rules, but what you see is like other legislative approaches that folks have taken, including in Canada, where I understand that in some jurisdictions there's presumed consent. Does, does that, is that kind of um, a, um, a change in the way this is framed? D does that do anything or does, does, or does, does that just make people angry? I guess um, is, is a question I would have. Uh, I'll take that one. Um, so I, I, uh, it's it's hard to know. Um, our most recent sort of public survey work, which occurred post pandemic, would suggest uh, uh, that the Ontario public don't want a presumed consent model at the moment, uh, which is not that surprising to us. I think like during the pandemic, people felt that government actions were sort of more controlling, and and so we're seeing that kind of response worldwide. In fact, we see we see that that pattern in the UK and and elsewhere. Um, we have some preliminary data from the UK to show that it they studied it as they implemented it in various regions, and they have not seen a substantial increase. Um, Nova Scotia, as you may or may not know, implemented that system recently. Um, there's a whole program of research surrounding that, that work, and um, they have not released their data yet. What came with their package of legislation wasn't only presumed consent, of course, it actually had lots of the features of the legislation that we currently have, which involved interaction with the coroner. And I, I have been known to say regularly that I think our our uh, relationship with the, the office of the chief coroner in Ontario is the best relationship an organ donation organization could have with a, a an organization like that. They basically provide us um, they basically provide almost no restrictions to organ donation, like less than less than one per year. And um, we have a bit more restriction on the tissue side because of the need for investigation there. But on an organ donation side, they they have actually embedded within their policy, for example, that 
that um, you know if the if the organ is going to save a life, um, we just need to be transparent about what that means in terms of loss of information during during the autopsy process in a in a suspicious death, for example, uh, or around a cardiomyopathy. Um, so they've really shifted their perspective to be very very family family centered, and that relationship continues, and that's been fostered through the new legislation in Nova Scotia. I would also say that of the leading countries that um, in organ donation, uh, aside from the U.S., most of more than half of them have a presumed consent model. So is it coming? Yes. Is it a healthcare decision? I don't think so. I think it's a political one. And to be honest, the advice of most people internationally are stand out of the way of the government. We have recommendations going to the going to the ministry that that, um, you know, that that will be discussed over the course of the next few months. And I, I think really it is a political decision. What's best for the population? I don't think we'll see big shifts um, in consent rate because it really impacts a small pr proportion of the of the people we approach. It predominantly would impact families who are not sure what their loved one would have wanted and have not said, you know, don't have a previously expressed wish to say no. Because even in a presumed consent model or deemed consent model, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, we're still asking the family. So even when I worked in Spain, even though there's a presumed consent there, their culture is really built around donation and soccer. And so they say yes all the time, you know. Um, uh, so, yeah, so I don't know that we move ourselves. I think there are some things we can do legislatively uh, that we're not doing currently, but I think the work is probably on building trust at the bedside, to be honest. That's our, that would be our focus. Yeah, that, that's great. Uh, Dave, do I have time for one more? One more, and then I'll go to Jose, and then we'll get Dr. Lawless to, to close. Great, I, and thanks for bringing that that focus back to the bedside, which I think was a real strength of, of both of your presentations. Um, a question from um, uh, a, a colleague in the audience who, who th says that um, um, that his perception um, at his hospital, sometimes they're a bit late to notify TGLN around uh, patients with imminent death or those that are for, for whom made is a consideration and just acknowledging the need to improve local processes um any sort of uh, sort of practical sort of granular advice on that um that, that you might want to give on how to go about doing it i know uh, janice mentioned um or maybe it was andrew um having stuff embedded in order sets which is which i think is is one potential strategy I think the people that are within the system already, the the hospital donation position, the the leaders within the critical care unit, really are are the people to sort of champion that. And that's about finding the process that works for you, because what's going to work for you at Sunnybrook is not going to work for Dave in Ottawa, might not work for Jose in Sudbury, um, you know, and might not work in any other hospital, to be honest. And you know, the 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 real the metric that speaks really importantly to me as an intensivist, and I mean, I, I'm a donation physician as much as you could be a donation physician and a champion as much as you can be but the the, the metric that most most uh, uh concerns me is approach i want to make sure every family is asked and we know that there are some hospitals in the province actually and mine was one of them in 2011 by the way when i was interviewed for my icu job they said oh if you're interested in donation don't come to brampton and i thought why, why not <laughs> and, you know like the people want to donate everywhere well, it turns out like our our conversion rate was was in was below twenty percent, and it it really had nothing to do with the patients or the families. We just weren't asking, and we weren't referring in time. And so I think you know the order sets a bit of a late catch. The respiratory pause is a late catch. You got to work with those health system leadership to find out what works best for you, so you're not missing those referrals. And there's lots of good strategies we can build collaboratively with your donation physician and your operational lead at the hospital. Help, help, help make sure the system is built. And increasingly, we're seeing customization of that. To be fair, great, thank you. That's great, uh, Jose. I'll go to you quick. We'll give a extra minute or two to. Yeah. Okay. This well, actually, it's it's not a short question. It's not a short answer to to a simple question of um, the impact on retrieval teams, depending where you are in the province, and how it influences because of the delays. How that influences uh, the family sometimes, where we've had um, you know families say yes, 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 and then okay, that's long enough. Um, so I'm just 
asking here, uh, this might be, this is a, like a million dollar question to a certain extent, but just some thoughts on how we may um, improve communication with our OR teams or maybe with our coordinator to make this happen faster. So any thoughts on that? Yes, do you want me to do that or you want to do it? No, you go ahead. I think the really important thing up front is to get a sense from the family what their expectations are. And those expectations need to be very clear to us. And increasingly what we're doing is we're saying, okay, if, you know, if the family says you have until Tuesday night at midnight, we set the birthday party at Tuesday night at midnight, and then whoever can come to the party comes to the party. So it's about establishing that marker as opposed to saying to a transplant team, I'm not sure when we're going to set the OR. We can already set the, that, that conversation. Um, there are considerations and flexibilities that need to be had, but at least those expectations from the family. And, you know, you've already built the trusting relationships with your families and patients. We rely upon you to work with our coordinator to ensure that those expectations are reasonably set. And I'm hoping within the next six months that we'll be able to say, if somebody says you can only have 12 hours, we don't say no, that we say, okay, if the organs look really good, We'll recover and then allocate them. So our systems are, we're driving towards that. Now, that's a sort of foreshadowing of what I hope is there in six months. And, you know, probably will take a lot longer. But but I do think that we have to drive towards a more family-centered process, regardless of where you are, um, especially since timing is the number one reason for decline. Uh, thank you, because I think this is one of the important pieces. Uh, and I like the fact that let's make it more family-centered and not necessarily the retrieval process as a centered, uh, yeah. as the centered piece. So thank you for that. Back to you, Dave. That's great. Well, thank you for a, a nice expedited answer as well, Andrew, given that we're just over time. So with that, I want to thank you both for taking the time uh, to come and speak with us uh, and share. Um, and uh, I, I truly appreciate it. And I think we're all committed to making this process that much better, um, given how many people are helped by it uh, yearly. So I'm gonna go to Dr. Lawless to, to close us out and thank you again to the CCSO staff for making this happen. Great, thanks Dave for so ably chairing again. And um, thank you, Andrew and Janice for your participation today. We really appreciate your involvement in this series. And I think it's important messages to bring to the critical care community across providers in terms of that shared sort of transition and the shared responsibility we have around uh, promoting and uh, nurturing organ donation and the benefit has for so many people. I just, listening to the presentation, I couldn't help just think of how my own practice has evolved over time and how the way things were sort of done when I started my training versus the way things are done now and the role of coordinators and and how it's, it's, it's better, but it, there's always room for improvement. And I think those are some of the takeaways I think we need to really sort of uh, look at and, uh, you know, try to continue quality improvement on those things. And thank you for your leadership in this area because if, if there's a lot of work you've done in this same sort of pioneering things and we all get to benefit from that as patients and families get to benefit from it. So thank you for your work. That's it. Thank you. And thank you everybody for joining who uh, was able to participate today. Thank you.